Yeah. Amen. Welcome. We are so excited that you're here. You've carved out this time to worship with us today. We are in week four of this series that we're titling Soul Music, where we're basically picking out some of our favorite psalms, some of the famous psalms, and unpacking them. And it's amazing how uh, these ancient songs written thousands of years ago are still so relevant and practical, helpful for our lives today. Uh, you know, I, I'm thankful. I don't know about you. I'm thankful for the book of Psalms. Um, because, you know, there's certain books of the Bible like Romans, Galatians, Ephesians. Praise God for those books um, that get all into uh, all the, the corners of deep theological ideas. Like we need those books of the Bible because the gospel is deep. Um, and, and so thankful for those. Um, but also thankful for the book of Psalms uh, that read a little bit more like the diary of an eighth grade girl, you know, <laughs> because a lot of times uh, that's where my soul's at. And uh, I just want to tell you, I mean, I, I hope you're getting it through this series is that um, God uh, created your mind and your intellect and he wants to connect uh, with you there. But if that's, if you've only intellectually connected with God, he has more, he has more for you. He has more for you. He wants to connect with you on a soul level and at the level of your heart and your emotions. And so uh, that's kind of what we're diving into in this series. We're in week four of that today. Um, whenever I was a freshman in high school, uh, my class, my first class, first period class that year uh, was on A floor at North Mesquite High School. Don't know if we have any other stallions in the room or online, yes. Uh, and so my, my first class was on A floor. And in order to get to class, my girlfriend, her, her class was on A floor as well. And in order to get to class, um, we had to uh, walk past this group of sophomore baseball guys. And I don't know how it was at your school, but this particular batch, sophomore baseball guys, jerks, you know, big jerks, bullies. And, uh, and so we, uh, over the series of a couple of weeks, like we would walk past uh, the baseball guys and um, they would harass us a little bit, make fun of us, that sort of thing. And uh, it eventually escalated to where um, this one morning we were walking past them and they pushed me, pushed me pretty hard uh, that I then like slammed into my girlfriend who slammed up uh, onto the brick wall and uh, slammed pretty hard to where her arm was bleeding as a result. And I was like ticked, wanted to do something, but there's nothing I could do about it because uh, I was a pipsqueak, you know, and I was outnumbered. And so uh, but, but I had had it, like something had to change. And so I uh, came with this great plan in my mind that afternoon. I went to my assistant principal at North and I said, I told him what had been happening. And I said, so here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow morning, uh, I'm going to meet you down there on a floor at 8 a.m. Talking to my assistant principal. And uh, I'm gonna, my girlfriend and I, we're going to walk past them. And when we do, you're going to see what they are doing. You know, we're going to set up a sting. And uh, then after they do it, you're, we're going to arrest them. And it's going to be great. And so I, my assistant principal was like, okay, okay, yeah, we'll look into it. And so uh, I go home that afternoon, excited about tomorrow. I'm going to get some vindication, finally. Uh, show up the next morning, as planned, 8 a.m. on A floor. And assistant principal didn't show up. Didn't show up at all. I'm like, what? what is your job if not to look after the student body, you know? And so... Um, I, was, I was pretty hurt and betrayed by that uh, and had to send my girlfriend on up ahead to make sure the coast is clear, you know, that morning. There's nothing else to do. So uh, it's just a stupid story. Just to, uh, I, I just wonder, have, have any of you ever been in the situation where you thought help was coming and it never came? You know, it, it's kind of like, uh, it, it's a recurring plot line in a lot of wartime movies, um, you know, that, You've, you've got the troops and they're standing strong and the field commander is like, just hold on, reinforcements are coming. And then eventually at some point, uh, as the movie goes on, the field commander communicates to his faithful troops, guys, the reinforcements aren't coming. And it, isn't that just such a sinking feeling when you're watching the movie? You ever experienced that sinking feeling in your life? Where, where what you were banking on, what you were hoping for, what you were looking to, and, and you thought it was going to come through, and it never came through. Man, isn't that a terrible feeling? And uh, really today, we're going to dive into that thought, into that place, and uh, hope that maybe we can help you to avoid ever confronting that feeling again in your life. 
So uh, we're going to be in Psalm 121. Just want to give you a little bit of a context before we dive in. Uh, as we've mentioned up until this point, there's various types of psalms uh, throughout the book of Psalm. Uh, the psalm we're looking at today, Psalm 121, is a psalm of ascent. What does that mean? Well, uh, faithful Jews, about three times a year, they took a pilgrimage to Jerusalem in order to partake in the religious festivals and sacrifices that were happening there. And so they would walk from the outlying areas, areas to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was on a, on a mount. It was elevated. And so wherever you were coming from, walking to Jerusalem, you were walking uphill. You were ascending. And so that's why these are called Psalms of Ascent. These are the songs they would sing on their journey to Jerusalem. And usually uh, they're pretty happy, celebratory, worshiping of God. So that's what we've got on our hands here, Psalm 121, let's dive in. You may have heard this before. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? Lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? That's an important question to ask yourself, isn't it? I mean, essentially, the psalmist is rhetorically asking the question, what is my hope in? What am I banking on in life? What am I ultimately trusting in? In. And in biblical days where the rule uh, of the day was kill or be killed, conquer or be conquered, uh, you lived your life with a head on a swivel. So nations, kings, citizens, they found their security in the power and might of their military. And th that's why David wrote in Psalm 20, verse 7. This is another little famous line from Psalm. David wrote in Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses. Well, yeah, makes sense, right? I mean, when your city comes under attack and all the fighting men go out to the city walls to put up a defense, you can imagine how you would feel back at home, right? I mean, like, if dad leaves the home and he goes out to the city wall to, to protect and defend your nation, and, and can you imagine just how you're feeling there at home? You're like, I mean, if they're successful, we all live. And if they're not successful, we die, like this afternoon. I mean, so you can understand how these uh, people living in this ancient context, you can, you can understand how what David says. It's like some put their hope in horses and chariots. Yeah, because if they fail, we die. And uh, so that's the place that they found themselves in. Even David, even David, the guy who wrote that line, Psalm 20, verse 7, some put their hope in horses and chariots. E yes, even David, the man after God's own heart, even he uh, found himself placing his hope hope and faith, of falling into that trap of placing it into military. Uh, we see that come to life in First Chronicles chapter 21. And at this point, we're going to jump into that story uh, there. And I think it's really going to help the psalm come back to life. We'll, we'll come back to Psalm 121 at the very end of the message. Um, but we're talking about this question, where does my help come from? And may we see it play out in 1 Chronicles 21, the story of David. So verse 1 says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. More specifically, David wanted to fight the valiant men, is what some versions of that passage say. He, he wanted to fight the fighting men. He wanted to count the soldiers, is what he was doing. Uh, he wanted to take stock of his military. The question was, how strong are we? How secure are we? Can I rest easy at night? Or should I be worried? Should I be working? Should we be building our defense. And it goes on verse two. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan, then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied, may the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over my Lord, the King. Are they not all my Lord's subjects? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? Joab, very, Joab the commander of David's military responds back very respectfully. David, I think this is a bad idea. Like, if you are concerned that our military is not as strong as it should be, well, man, let's pray to God, and God will multiply our troops. You know, we can increase the military budget. Uh, but I think this is a bad idea to go off and count all of the fighting men. Joab said, if you do it, you're going to bring guilt upon all of Israel. Which, whenever I read that, I'm like, really? Are you going to bring guilt? This is... This is wrong to do. Like, doesn't it kind of seem like uh, knowing how many fighting men are in your country, knowing the size of your military, doesn't that seem like a, a harmless thing for a king to do? And you would, we would probably argue, responsible thing? Like, probably should know how many fighting men he has. 
And I would say, yeah, I think you can make that argument that it is harmless, even responsible, unless you are counting because a little part of your faith is in that which you are counting. And I just want to say, side note, uh, right here, this is where it starts getting practical right, right now, is uh, man, pay attention to what your little heart feels the need to count. Pay attention to what you feel tempted to count, to check, and recheck. And so David didn't heed Joab's warning. He insisted on getting the count, so Joab did it. And a while later, the numbers came back. And verse, says, verse 5 says the numbers were good. It says that there were 1.1 million fighting men in Israel. Just by comparison, uh, I Googled it. I'm not sure if this number is totally accurate, but it said that the U.S. currently has 1.4 million active military members. So this tiny little nation, ancient nation of Israel, they only had 300,000 less than we currently have. And so the report was very good uh, for the Israelites. How do we know, though, if it was sin for David to count his troops? And I would just say, well, if on that night, after the report came back and the numbers were good, it, it gives us a hint uh, that there's something off in David's soul if he fell asleep a little easier that night. If he experienced a little more peace in his soul on that particular evening. If that was true, then it was revealing of the fact that at least a certain amount of David's faith was in his horses and chariots. And you may be thinking, oh, come on, Casey. Like, can we really blame David as this leader of this uh, ancient nation in a wartime context? Like, can't we cut the guy some slack? And I'm saying, no, David... Uh, of all the people, David should have understood that his security really had nothing to do with the size or might of his military. What am I talking about? You remember Goliath? Remember Goliath? Like, uh, Goliath was the number one soldier for the Philistine army, right? D scriptures say that he was nine feet tall, something like nine feet tall. And uh, the Philistine army had just decided, hey, let's... Uh, Let's just sat, settle this battle between us, mano y mano. Like, we don't all have to fight and die. It's just, we'll put up our best soldier, Goliath. Y'all put up your best, whoever you choose, whoever wins. That's who wins this battle here. And so every day, Goliath came out. It says for 40 days, he would come out, and he would taunt the Israelite army, and no one wanted a piece of him until little old David. And remember, Scripture tells us that David was kind of the runt of the litter, of his brothers. He was short in stature. And so automatically, we see right off the top, he doesn't measure up to Goliath in a physical sense. And then in addition to that, uh, Goliath was this trained, experienced soldier. David was a shepherd. He had never received any formal military training. And so on paper, uh, David had no business going up against Goliath. And yet he won. Why? Because, uh, on paper, the numbers, it, it is no match for the power and presence of God. And so that, that, that was the X factor there. So David, of all people, should have known, you know what? My security does not lie in the power and strength of our military prowess. Like David should have known that more than anyone. And uh, where does my help come from? That, that's the question that Psalm 21 starts off asking. Where does my help come from? And, you know, I think that's a question we should all ask ourselves. I think that's something that really, um, man, you would be well served to go home and munch on that a little bit this afternoon and throughout this week of really doing some soul work there. Of where, where does my soul look for help and for security and provision I wonder what you look to for your help. I'd be willing to say that for many of us, it's money, right? It's that thought of, man, if we can just get to that certain income level, or if we can just get to that number in the bank account or in the portfolio, well then, man, uh, I can rest and uh, I, I can have peace in my soul. Can get, I don't have to be striving anymore. Like we can just relax and begin to enjoy life. And uh, the reason why I know about that is because, man, that's my... That's my own personal little natural proclivity that, that for me, whatever reason, money equals security in my heart oftentimes. 
And so I, I have that thought. It's like, man, if we can just get to that income level, well, then we'll be set. We'll be good. Like, we won't have any worries. We'll, we can finally have peace. It's, it's going to be all right. And uh, I remember when God really convicted me of this in a very pointed way was uh, Pastor David Griffin was leading our church staff meeting one day about 12 years ago. And David said, um, which revelation would wreck you more? The revelation that God is not real, there is no God, or that your bank account had zero dollars in it. Something like that, that's how David worded it. And uh, man, I just remember it immediately in my heart. I mean, the answer was obvious. It was like zero in the bank account. <laughs> because like, if God's not real, it's like, oh, okay, guess I was kind of duped for a while. We'll just figure it out, you know? Like, we'll just figure out a new path and we'll, that was kind of, but zero in the bank account, what do we do? You know, like, what do you do? What do you, and, um, even though that's what, that was like my immediate answer. I knew it was wrong. I was convicted about it. And um, and really, really dealt with God on that and still wrestling through that today to an extent because that's just my natural, that's where my heart goes. Money equals security. It's just this idea. If we can get to that place, well, then it's gonna be good. I mean, I'm striving. And, and you know really what it's about in my heart? It's like um, maybe we can become so financially secure that we can weather any storm that life or God throws at us. And yes, I know how ridiculous that statement sounds. This try, trying to weather a storm that God may send. Uh, I mean, really what it is, is trying to create an environment that doesn't even require faith in God. You know, get, my position, get myself into a position where I don't even need God. Even if he abandons me, we'll be totally fine. And I think that's the reason why uh, Jesus said it is more difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of, heaven, kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Uh, what was Jesus saying? I, I don't think Jesus was saying that it's wrong to have money. Um, I think what Jesus was saying is that whenever you start to have a little bit of it, man, it is just so tempting to start putting your hope and your faith and security in it because it feels like, why do I need God? Life is good. I can solve every problem that comes my way. Thus is the temptation with money. It's not bad to have a bunch of it. It's just if you do get a little bit of it, it's better guard your heart. And uh, e even the U.S. government realizes this tendency of ours to place our hope and faith in money. And so they print a little reminder on our money for us. How kind of them. In God we trust. <laughs> You know, our money says it. Don't put your trust in this. Put your trust in God. So that's so nice of our government to put that on there. Um, and here's the deal. Isn't, isn't this what David's sin was? David was like, you know, there's, there's been times in my life, in my life, where, man, we were up against it, and God had to bail us out, and I'm thankful for it. But honestly, I'd rather never find myself again in a position where I needed God to bail me out. So let's go count the soldiers and see where we're at. See if we need to keep building. See if we're good and can have peace. Let's go check, check the bank account again. See where we're at. See if we can feel good and peace in our soul. Maybe it's not money that you're tempted to put your faith in. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe your spouse, you know, they're your rock. They're your source of happiness and joy and contentment. You find your security in them. And the problem with, with that is if you are looking for a person to provide things for you that were meant to only be provided by God, it, it, it is doomed for failure and disappointment. Uh, Jerry Maguire said it right. He's the one who coined, you complete me as a man. Well, yeah, that's the problem. You know, that's the problem. You're coming into the relationship at a deficit. And if you're coming into a relationship at a deficit and looking for someone to provide wholeness to you, newsflash is not going to work very well. <laughs> like it may work for a moment while the person, like while your dysfunction is cute. You remember that? When the person's dysfunction was kind of cute <laughs> in the beginning. And then you see it for what it really is as time goes on. Yeah, no, it's like, 
if you, and maybe that's the problem in your marriage. Maybe that's why your spouse is such a disappointment is because you are asking them to be something for you that only God can be for you. And you would be amazed at whenever you look to God to provide for you the things that he is supposed to be providing for you of how it uh, makes it to where you don't feel the need to look to your spouse to give you those things. Maybe it's not your spouse. Maybe it's friends. Uh, Lauren and I, we realized this a, a while back that, you know, I think honestly, we were thirsty for friendships, you know? And so we would latch on to people and we would expect them to provide something for us. And it was great, you know, whenever they're providing that for us. But whenever it stopped for whatever reason, we would find ourselves getting frustrated. And it's like, well, and if we came to realize, you know what, we are, we are putting on them something, A, they didn't sign up for, and B, that they could never fulfill inside of us. Uh, maybe that's not your temptation. Maybe it's not money. Maybe it's not relationships. Maybe you're tempted to put your hope in the government or a certain political party or a candidate. And, you know, I think this past election cycle, I think we can all agree, uh, exposed this pretty clearly that people on both ends of the political spectrum losing their ever loving minds. <laughs> Seemed pretty clear that politics has become religion to some. It's a part of their faith system. You know, people on both sides of the political spe spectrum acting like the world was going to end if the other guy won. And can we just pause right here? Just right here in this moment, now that we have just a, a, you know, a little bit of distance from all that, I, I believe we're something like 180 days into President Biden's uh, term as president. And just want to say to all the Trump voters, let's, uh, let us notice the country has not imploded. And all the Trumpers said, yet. <laughs> Give it time. Uh, and if I can say to all the Biden voters, we're 180 days in, you know, we are one eighth of the way through this term. And yet it still seems that our country is facing all of the same major problems that we were facing before he came into office. So all I'm saying is, uh, President Biden, you get to decide if he's a good president or not. I don't really care. You, you get to decide uh, what, what, if you think he's a good president or not. But one thing I will say definitively, terrible God, and uh, Donald Trump, you get to decide what you think of him as president. Terrible God. Yeah. Barack Obama, worthless God. Yeah. W, no, bad God. And I don't, I don't know who it is that you feel like is the best president of your lifetime. It's Clinton, Reagan, somebody else. Uh, listen, they, they may have been a good leader for the nation in your opinion, but they are not on par with the Savior. And can we all just, both sides of the aisle, can we just come to a place of agreement that what our nation needs goes beyond what any man can provide, that no man is gonna be the Savior of this nation because no man can save a nation. We need, only God can do that, first of all. And can we just take a step back from that and just say, you know what? Even if America ceased to exist, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ would march on. And so, um, you know, not to Jesus juke everybody in here uh, at this moment, but, you know, it just really appeared, it was a little alarming to us, I think, I think as pastors, somewhat to, you know, seeing, seeing our people, we're on Facebook a little bit and everything and seeing a lot of our people, it seems like, man, you had a lot, of more, a lot more gusto about evangelizing people to your political persuasion than we've ever seen about trying to evangelize people to your personal Lord and Savior. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe it reveals that maybe we are more political than we are spiritual. If you're more political than you are spiritual, it seems like your God is politics, your God is government, your God is a man. Uh, I see how it happens. No one wakes up one day and says, you know what, I'm gonna make money my God. I'm gonna make spouse my God. Uh, I'm gonna make this candidate my God. No one does that. It's a gradual drift because, you know, I, I, I get it. Money does solve a lot of problems, right? 
and spouses can serve a lot of your needs. You can find a lot of intimacy in your spouse. Uh, government is certainly an agent of change in the world, but there's a problem. See, David said, Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses. And then in verse 8, he says, but here's what happens for those who are placing their trust in that type of thing. They are brought to their knees and fall. You see, the issue is you place your trust in anything other than God, and eventually it will fail you or master you. And Jesus is the only one that you can place as the master of your heart and soul and life that will lead to your freedom. Everything else will crush, her, crush you or master you, enslave you. Only Jesus will set your soul free. And so, yeah, there's a certain amount of security from having a good job that pays six figs. But you know what? Companies downsize. And that's great to have a robust portfolio, but market crashes happen. And spouses can fulfill a lot of your emotional needs. Uh, but you know what? Sometimes spouses die tragically early or sometimes divorce happens or sometimes they just cease to meet those needs over time. And, and maybe you love everything about a certain president, but term limits insist he can only serve for eight years. Whatever you are placing your hope and faith and trust in, if it is not God, it will fill you, God, uh, fail you. God is the only one who will not disappoint. And here's where it can get a little difficult for us to swallow because God is a good and a loving father. He will not let you go on putting your trust and hope in a God that is going to fail you. He will break you of your false faith and bring you back to authentic faith in him. If, if you're one of his children, he will, he will break you of it and bring you back to him. That's what it says in Proverbs 3, uh, verse 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke for the Lord disciplines those he loves as the father, the son, he delights in. And that's exactly what God did with David in this account that we're looking at in 1 Chronicles 21, where he counted his fighting men against the Lord's will. God comes to David and says, uh, you messed up, buddy. Like, that, that was sin, and so we're going to discipline you uh, in love uh, so that you learn. And uh, so God gave, it was kind of unique what God did here with David. He gave him three options to choose from. Uh, he said, you can experience three years of famine or three months of being ransacked by your enemies or option three, three days of the sword of the Lord, three, day, three days of a plague, basically. And so David chose option three saying, let me fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is very great, but do not, do not let me fall into human hands. And so and then verse 14 says, so the Lord sent a plague on Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. And you see what happened here? David's heart starts to trust in his numbers a little bit. And next thing you know, God wipes out 70,000 of these men that he just counted. And don't you think for David, it was like message received, yeah. God. It's like, I felt like for a moment that my security was found in the strength of my military and the numbers came back and the numbers were good. And I went to bed that night feeling great, feeling secure, had the most sound night of sleep I've had in a long time. Next day I wake up, boom, those numbers have been reduced by 70,000. Message received, God. How quickly can this thing that you're putting your trust in be brought to zero? And it's a gracious thing from God. When he pulls the rug out from underneath your feet because you are standing on false faith and a false God. I'm not trying to paint with broad universal strokes here, but I am saying, I've, I, I don't know about you, I can testify to this is how God has worked with me and handled me in my life. So I already told you my, my natural kind of pro proclivity is to put my faith, my hope in money. And uh, there's, there's been a couple times, two times now in my adult life where God has brought our family's bank account down to zero through a series of unforeseen events. And uh, you know, it's like it was only there when I experienced my greatest fear in life, it was only there that I realized it's not that bad. 
And God still took care of us and showed up and provided for us in really miraculous ways. And so like looking back on those two seasons of our life now, I look back on them as Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 moments where God disciplines like, all right, you and that's what you want to do? You want to make money your God? Well, because I love you, I'm going to rip that rug out from underneath you and show you that you don't need it for security. You don't need it for peace. You don't need it for your provision. And looking back, I'm like, I don't want to go through another season like that. Like I prefer to just avoid that again if I can. But looking back on it, I'm, I'm thankful for those two seasons in my life because of what God taught me there. Like his, his dis- it was discipline, felt like discipline at the time. Absolutely. But it now on the other side of it is, man, it's so gracious from God to bring me back to that place of, of setting him on the throne of my life. David received the message from God, First Chronicles 21, 16. David looked up, saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with a drawn sword in his hand extended over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell face down. And David said to God, was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Lord, my God, let your hand fall on me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. And so here's the deal. What do you do whenever you realize you've been placing your faith in something other than God? You do what David did. What did David do? David confessed and repented from his sin. David completely owned it. Don't you, don't you just love this? Like, <laughs> he didn't say, uh, my account was hacked. You know, he, he completely owned it, a public figure uh, owning his mess and said, you know, this is all me. Like he called together his community group. It says that he got together with the elders and he just proclaimed to everybody, guys, this one's on me. Like the, the, the difficult situation we find ourselves in, this is because of my sin and my mess up as a leader of this nation. He confessed and he repented of his sin. And uh, the angel of the Lord instructed David to go to Ornan, this guy Ornan, his, his uh, threshing floor and to make a sacrifice to God. And so David obeyed the angel of the Lord. He goes to Ornan and he says, um, I need to make a sacrifice on your threshing floor. I need to buy your threshing floor. And Ornan's like, no, nah, I'm not gonna let you pay me for the threshing floor. You're the king, I'm gonna give it to you. Also, I'm, I'll throw the oxen in for free as well be my honor for you to take those oxen in. And David replies back with this beautiful response, but man, we we could preach a whole 45 minute sermon just on that. He says, no, I refuse to offer a sacrifice to the Lord that costs me nothing. And so he pays Ornan, buys the floor and buys the oxen and sacrifices the oxen there to God. Very interesting to me. So this is First Chronicles chapter 21. The very next chapter in First Chronicles chapter 22, it says that while David was worshiping God in that spot, in that moment, he says, here shall be the house of the Lord God and here the altar, a burnt offering for Israel. So what you need to know, up until this point, Israel uh, was worshiping in the tabernacle. It was, it was a tent. It was non-permanent structure. They were doing set up, tear down church, you know? Shout out to our set up and tear down teams who have served across all four campuses over the years, you know? Uh, we're familiar with this. And, and so David and them, they've been doing set up, tear down church. And, and, but God has placed this desire on his heart of having a permanent uh, place, a temple, to, to create a temple for God. And so I, I never knew this until my study for this message, but it was in this moment at Ornan's floor that David said, hey, this place, this place right here, like from this place, I will worship God, not just me though, that the generations to come from me, like we're drawing a line in the sand that from this place we will worship God forevermore. That that's what you do, that's what you do. Whenever you realize that you, your heart has gone after other gods, that whenever you come back in that repentance and in that brokenness, you drop anchor right there and you say, uh, like, I'm not gonna be moved from this place ever again. Like I was kind of, I was tricked, I was deceived, I went after other things, but now I know, I know better. And you know what? I'm gonna have a little alarm, alarm set up in my mind to where when I start to drift away, it, it's, I'm, I'm gonna be mindful of it and I'm gonna come back to this place right here and always be reminded that God is my God. There is no other. He sits on the throne of my heart. And that's what you do. 
that's what you do whenever you discover that your heart has been chasing after your help and your hope and your security in other places. You confess and you repent and you come back to that place. You drop anchor. Say never again. God is my God. And then the second thing you do is then you remind yourself of where your help comes from. Like from all, for all the rest of your days, you remind yourself proactively where your help comes from. That's what the Psalm is, Psalm 121, that we are, are finally getting to reading all the rest of it. That, that's what the Psalm is. It's a reminder of it's a song. I imagine the author, whoever wrote it, I imagine the author was like, they had chased after some other gods and they had been burnt by it. And they wrote this song just as a reminder of themselves. No, 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 no. I'm always going to put my hope and trust in God. It says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. And don't you love that right there? That promise? Man, if you'll just trust God, He's going to watch over your life. Just trust Him. Make Him the God of your heart and your soul. He's, he's going to watch over your life. He's going to make sure you have what you need. He's going to make sure that you're taken care of. Man, He takes care of the birds who are sold for a penny. That's what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. How much more so is He going to take care of you? He clothes the lilies of the field in more splendor than King Solomon. He's going to make sure you're clothed. Just trust Him. He will watch over you and then verse 8 the Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore the psalmist was writing here God is the one who takes care of me God is the one who's always been there God is the one who has never failed me so yeah money is nice to have but the Lord is the one who gives and takes away the Lord is my provision and a spouse is a blessing but marriage at its best is an earthly picture of the intimacy that can be found in God and government impacts daily life but God is sovereign over all God is my help that's what the psalmist is saying God is my help God is my help God is my support I'm going to remind myself of that today this day every day forevermore my, I look up to the mountains where does my help come from man I'm not just caught in some uh, like the vague power of the universe and I hope things play out okay for my life no I have a God who knows me and created me and is looking after me I have a God who is supplying all my needs so I God's my help God is where my faith is in and so Lord would you convict us